How you doing? Thank you. Uh, okay, John, I will text you before we start. As usual. How you doing? Oh, outside now, huh? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Are you really outside? Where is that? Yeah, it's a new place. Is that a different oratorium? Yeah, temporarily. Oh. Uh, okay, John. I'm not starting to now. No. No. Yeah. The microphone sounds distant. Oh, it's, it's not hooked up to the microphone, right? Can you, can you go to the microphone and speak? Yeah, or what is Dr. Sabaya going to have? Your headphones? Your head? No, no, as usual, as usual. Okay, what he usually uses, he's going to do? Usually, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, okay I'm not uh, starting sharing from now. Okay. I can hardly hear you. Can you hear me now? John? Yeah, I can hear you okay now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, see you before. I'm not starting sharing from now, okay? I'll do some editing and come back. Okay, okay.
Well, welcome, Anas. Hello. Yeah. How are you doing? Alan, what's Alan? Uh, do you want to? Your camera doesn't seem to be on. Do you want to turn your camera on, please? Uh, how can I, uh, I start video? Yeah. Uh, okay. Go go to the bottom of the of the screen. Oh yeah, how are you doing? Yeah, hi. Okay, where are you where are you at? I am in Germany. In oh, Germany. good, excellent. Where what part? Um, neurosurgery. Okay, no, but what part of Germany? Uh, Digendorf, uh, Bayern. Okay, good. Welcome. I, I've never met you before. First time? Yeah, this is the first time. Oh, excellent, excellent. Are you on the mailing list? Uh, do you want to be on the mailing list? Yeah, can, uh, yeah. Yeah, you put your email in the chat box. There's a chat box here. It's probably the first time you've used this platform, right? Go to the chat box. Is it at the bottom of your screen? It says chat. And I have to write my email. Yeah. Yeah. Just give me your email. I'll put it in the list. And you can also download our app, Neurosurgical TV. Uh, right. Right now, it's on the front page of the app. Matter of fact, this conversation we're having right now is on the front page of the app. So you can download that app when you want to download it. It's it's pretty fast. Yeah. How, how can how can I download? Yeah. It? Go to the uh, go to the. Uh, what do you have? An Android or an a or an iPhone? I have iPhone. Okay. Go to the Apple Store. And and just type in neurosurgical TV. Okay, uh, uh, one minute here at Apple Store. Uh, in neurosurgical TV, yeah. Right, neurosurgical TV. Surgical TV application. Okay, I found it. Get. Okay, good. Okay, now open that app and you're going to see us talking now on the front page. Uh, wait a minute here. Where are I open? I opened this on the email password. Oh, you may have to, okay, whatever. You have to set up the account, I guess. Hey, Dr. Kabulo. Hi, here. Email. And, uh, I have yeah, you have to set up an account. It, it, it's, it asks you for your email and password, right? But once you create, once you log in, then it's, you know, it automatically opens when you start the app. Hey, Dr. Kabulo. Hey, Dr. Cabullo. Yes, Dr. Pat, how are you? Good, good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Your background is all screwed up again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can, I can see your students, but I can't see your face. Yeah. There we go. There we go. How you, how you been? Uh, I'd like you to meet Dr. Anas uh, Abu Aish from Germany. Germany. <laughs> And this is Dr. Kubulo from the Congo. Hello. Hello, Dr. Anas, how are you? I am fine, how are you? Good, um, good. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, you're getting to know Dr. Sabaya well, uh, Dr. Kubulo. Ah, my volume is too low. I don't know how I can increase it. Oh, okay. No, I can hear you good. 
But you can't hear me. Can you hear me? One minute. Hold on. Should I have to create an account, yeah? Uh, well, I don't know how you download apps. However you download apps, just, fo just follow the directions. What, what does it say? Does it give you directions? When you, try, when you open the app, does it say open an account or register or something? No, yeah, account, uh, I should... Uh... Yeah, open an account, or what I guess. Do you have an Apple account? Do you have an uh, account with Apple Store? The Outlook, man. Did you mean Outlook? Oh, uh, me. No, no. You got to have an account for the Apple Store. Uh, oh. Yeah, not it doesn't email doesn't matter. You've got to have it with the Apple or Android Store. If you're using an iPhone, you've got to have an account with the with an with the uh, Apple Store. Okay, I use it. Yeah. Well, when, whenever you want to set it up, set it up. But, uh, yeah, let me take care of some things here. I'll be back in a few minutes, okay? Okay. Hey, Dr. Kabulo. Neurosurgical you team, you can't hear you properly. Yeah, you you had it. You had the right app. You had it. It was no. You had the right app. Okay, can I see? Yeah, are you showing me the screen or something? Oh no. Okay, we're about to start the conference. Yeah, uh, Arias, what we do with this uh, with this particular webcast, we do it every Wednesday. It's like grand rounds, like any grand rounds are. And they ask questions in the audience. And then after it's over, he asks uh, the, you and Dr. Gabulo and whoever else we have, he comes on the panel and will ask your, answer your questions, your comments, if you have any, okay? Okay, Arias. Yeah, we'll we'll let you know when after the you know he's finished his presentation because he's giving it in in an auditorium now in in Amman, Jordan. And after the conference, the the webcast ends. He goes, okay, and the internet people, you have questions. It's quite a nice platform. Uh, hey, Dr. Dr. Kabulo, we're, we're setting up, trying to set up a cadaver lab in Nairobi. When is it starting? Well, I don't know. We're trying to set it up. I just talked to the people in the Nairobi because they have a cadaver lab there, and we yeah. want to we want to televise it. Uh, you know, oh. uh, it may That's be good. useful uh, in Africa, not only neurosurgery but other parts of uh, dissection. So if you have nothing better to do, you can watch dissections of the heart. <laughs> I 
We're doing that with Dr. Khalif. You know Dr. Khalif, right? Yes, I know Khalif. Yeah. Okay. Now, his conference in Nairobi, is in March next year? Yeah, it's in March. March. Yes. Yeah, a lot of conferences in March. I think we're going to televise Dr. Kabulo from Tanzania this week. Oh, I saw, I saw there is a conference in Tanzania this week. Yeah, yeah, I think we're going to, we're, we're trying to televise it. We, I think we will be able to. I, I've wow. talked to the technicians. We're trying to mm -hmm. set it up technically. It's, it, it looks like a pretty good conference. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, let me, let me screen share it. It's okay. Oh, I can't. I can't. They're using the other. They're using the screenshot. I can't do it. Anyways, I, let me. I, I'm going to send you the uh, program. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I have a question. The data couldn't be read because it's not in a correct format. Uh, hold on. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Arias. Oh, oh, I can't. I'll, I'll have to send them some other time, Dr. Gabul. I can't do it. Okay, uh, what do I want to get back to, Arias? Uh, Arias, you can't. What is it? What's it? What's it? It's blocking, huh? It's not downloading it, okay? What'd you, what'd you say? Um, uh, um... I create an account. Yeah, can I see the? Can I see that? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, I can't read that. It's unfortunate. It's too small. It's too small. Okay. Sorry. What does it say? Sorry, I can't read that. Sorry. You are not too allowed. Okay. Can you do me a favor, Arias? Can you take a, a screenshot of that and send it to me? Uh, because I'm working, I'm, I'm talking to the developer tomorrow from Bulgaria. He's helping me with the app. And I want to show him problems with working out the bugs now, you know. Because it's in beta. Uh, how can I send it? Uh, how can you, you need to take, well, um, Messenger. You, you know how to take a, a picture of your screen? You, uh, oh, okay. Okay. Let me, let me give you my email. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. I'll give it to you. Yeah, here I got it. Okay. Yeah, we're meeting. The, we're still in beta. We got a, uh, you know, an, another one of my associates got the same message on his iPhone. So there's obviously a problem with iPhone. Doctor Gabulo, do you have the app Neurosurgical TV? I, I failed to, love, to download last time on my iPhone. Oh, yeah, you, know, uh, you know, we're having a problem, I think, with iPhones for some reason. Okay. Are you able to download it okay on an iPhone or no? No, I'm failing to download on iPhone. Oh, okay. okay. You have an mm -hmm. iPhone, right? 
Yes, I have an iPhone. Oh, okay. Have you tried downloading the program, the, the mm. app? No, I failed to download that app on oh, iPhone. Oh, okay. Okay. Did you try? Did you succeed on iPhone? Uh, yeah, there's a, been a problem. We're going to start now. Yeah. Hello. Okay. We're going to keep, and after we'll have questions. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. He's going he's to start in a second. I thought of putting this picture from my dad. That's 1935. 1938, a group of students with their teachers. An ordinary street in the hands, 43, 63. And this is M. Chirac, who was then the Prime Minister of France, visiting the main library in Baghdad. Baghdad and Iraq, the great country, great nation. Uh, the topic for tonight is radical accession of clinical and tumor, clinical and radiological laboratory and pathological combination. And when you never mention clinical and tumor, you come close to the third ventricle. So we need to know about the third ventricle. This is the view of the third ventricle, the roof, the material wall, the material wall, and the floor. It's a piece of anatomy which is difficult, and that's why people do not want to go there. This is the roof. And that picture on your left is the roof, and you can see the silver veins there. And if you look at it from above, you can see both internal silver veins. And if you look at the floor from below, you can see the middle bodies down there. There we are, the middle bodies, and the floor of the third ventricle. And if you look at the floor from above, starting from anterior to posterior, you come at the chiasm, and then you go backwards like this. This is what you see with the endoscope, until you come to the aqueduct of cells. The cereal wall is basically where the pineal gland is, the suprapineal basis, and the posterior culture. The lateral wall is very difficult because it is made of nuclei. <coughs> These nuclei are arranged in a certain fashion that if you don't know them, it's a disaster. So they are arranged from anterior to posterior in three groups, and they are arranged from medial to lateral in three groups. So here we have each of these groups with a certain function. So the anterior group, i.e. the preoptic, the supraoptic, the chiasmatic, Nuclei are concerned with your sex development and with your circadian rhythm. Uh, while the middle ones are concerned with your eating habits, hunger habits, and so on. And the posterior ones are related to your mood. So your very existence is controlled by these nuclei. The anterior wall is made by the laminar terminalis, which is this one. So the hypothalamus, which is four grams in weight, imagine four grams of weight of hypothalamus controlling your life, everything in your life. 
they control your food intake, fluid intake, metabolism, growth, sex and reproduction, temperature control, circulation control, i.e. blood pressure, blood stability. Wake up cycle, sleep, wake up cycle. The anger and attack defense are liberated. So it is the very existence of your life. That's kind of So, as we said, that we have three groups of NPI, it is the main, the anterior group, the middle group, and the posterior group. And I mentioned that the supraoptic and the preoptic and suprachiasmatic system of NPI are concerned with the circadian rhythm and the production and so on. And the middle ones are related to your metabolism in terms of hunger, eating, thirst, etc. And the posterior ones are related to your memory and emotions. So here you are, this is 3D showing you the nuclear. The five grams of your body that controls it completely. Now we're talking about cranial genome. So what is cranial genome? It's a tumor, it's a benign tumor, but with a very ugly uh, sort of course. In the dietary group, it's different from other groups, but in the dietary group, it constitutes six to nine percent of tumors, in others, it is three percent. Male is slightly more than female, unfortunately for us. How often do you see a clinical journal? It's very rare. So an average new research might operate on one clinical journal every two to three years. In the States, about 300 million, in the world, only 120 cases of clinical journal are received. So it is rare to see anybody in the world having this case. We have two peaks for the benefit job. Usually children, but you always forget, we always forget that there's another peak in old age, 50 to 70. This is my youngest patient, and this is my oldest patient. How does it develop? When you are in nature, the fourth week of gestation, there is sort of process that goes from your pharynx and the process that comes from the brain, they need to develop. If this process continues to stay, which should be disappeared at the time of birth, which is called the Ratkin's pouch, then this is the reason why we develop the cranial function. So here we are, the two processes meeting, forming the pituitary glands, the Ratkin's persist, and that would cause tumor of cranial function, either within the cell or above the cell, or maybe very high. So understanding this embryology is very important. So we're well, speaking about three types of cranial genomes. This is the communist in the group, 80 to 85, which is supercellular. 5% within the cell, 5% completely within the third branch of totally, exclusively on the third branch of while the others are supercellular extension. This paper, of intrachiasmatic cranial angioma, which is inside the chiasm. And if you know the embryology, you will not wonder. Can it go malignant? Yes. Cranial angioma can turn malignant. If you leave it for a long time, one of the theories of cranial malignancy, as you all know, is chronicity. So if you have a bladder infection for a long period of time, it's in a bladder stone, you may develop carcinoma of the bladder. If you leave that tumor in, playing with it with all kinds of nonsense medications and procedures, then it can turn malignant. 
And this is how things evolved. How did we understand the claim of that job? Stino from Slovenia, uh, Slovak Republic, he's a close friend of mine. We usually meet in the claim of the job meeting. Uh, but this very beautiful paper about the relationship of the claim of NGO to the Slavic sections, he really added to our knowledge and experience with it. So he said, listen, your tumor rising from the cellular longer could be extraventricular. So this is the problem that completely not reaching the dead matter. Here it is intraventricular. Here it is both. But look at this. Here the flow is intact. Here the flow is intact, but the tumor is totally inside. Here the flow is interrupted, so the tumor is inside and outside. Uh, that's why also mentioned with this paper about how the mammillary bodies they are pushed by the tumor. So this is the mammillary body. The larger tumor was upper lateral, was upper lateral, and goes out. So you can actually excise the clear job completely without damaging these nuclei that we have mentioned. And that's because we understand the biology and the relationship. With the same paper, we measured the angle here between the mammillary body and the lone axis of the brainstem to show the mammillary body how it is uh, displaced. So you can see how much it is displaced. As we said, the pregnancy can occur in this kind of angiomas. In this paper, they identified 23 cases of malignant kind of angiomas. Another case of malignant kind of angioma from the SA. So, histopathology here is different. We have two types of kind of angiomas, and I think the two first of us here. I've seen them. Okay, we'll wait until he comes in the Basically, he, there are two types, the pillory type and the adamantinoma type. This is the most difficult. Adamantinoma comes in kids and children, the pillory comes in adults. The more difficult to excite is the adamantinoma because they have tentacles and they like to stick to the surrounding structures. So I will just uh, drop on this uh, slides and get it uh, as it comes. And then we can ask them to this, uh, draw these uh, markers. And he would also mention the publications that we have done together. And these publications have been published and uh, recognized uh, investigators in this field. And this is one of the papers. And this has been accepted in the American Pathology Academy. So what is the treatment of these kind of angiomas? Basically, surgery is the mainstay, but there are others. There's the nucleotides, chemotherapy, syntactic chemotherapy, conventional radiotherapy, and so on. Surgery can be using different approaches. You can go through the cortex and the ventricle. You can go between the two hemispheres. You can go subfrontal. You can go teleonium, transvasal, transpatosal, or through the nose, transvenoidal microscope or transvenoidal endoscope. But what is the most feared of management of these kind of angioma? It is the and electrolyte and water minerals. And for this, I ask the Kajuman Caesar in the camera just to speak about. The water and the life of this. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, colleagues. Uh, how can you? Manual? Uh, and no, not manual. <clears throat> I will talk uh, about electrolyte disbalance in patients with craniopharyngioma. Uh, the most common presentation in children, it is central diabetes insipidus. It is pre-op presentation, either uh, short stature 
or visual field defects or intermittent sometimes that is in, in sepsis. I'm a witness of several cases of diabetes uh, in sepsis, which is that disappeared for a little bit and nobody to take care about it. And later on, two or three years then, with uh, visual field impairment, screen pharyngioma was discovered. Uh, around 16 to 55 percent of patients they uh, experience uh, central diabetes insipidus before surgery, and uh, permanent diabetes insipidus after surgery usually up to 80 percent of the cases. Transit uh, diabetes insipidus it is around 13 percent of the cases. The classical response after surgery in patients uh, subjected to a craniotomy or uh, Transphenoidal approach, usually it is a craniotomy because, as Dr. Dr. Brian mentioned, it is usually with supracellar extension, you cannot excise the whole tumor via the transphenoidal approach. Uh, the usual manifestation when you cut the, uh, the stalk, usually immediately there is a DI. Often it is intraoperative during surgery the anesthesia and neuro, uh, neurosurgeon, they can observe the polyuric. Uh, the, sometimes the polyuric phase, it continue for three, four days, then it, it can be followed by uh, three to five days of uh, hyponatremia on the opposite with the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Then uh, eventually it, the patient fall in permanent uh, uh, that is uh, it is frequent, this sequence, I mean a triphasic response, it is common in children. It is in this paper, it is, although it is a mini series of around 30 uh, patients only, around 30% of the patients, they experience a triphasic response after surgery. Some of the patients, they do not experience triphasic response, just diabetes and symptoms uh, all the way. Uh, of course, uh, if uh, we are dealing with uh, diabetes insipidus after surgery, no need to do extensive workup. It is evident uh, we, you have a triple combination of uh, polyuria. If uh, we notice that there is a polyuria of more than 250 ml per hour over two consecutive hours with diluted urine, usually urine osmolarity less than uh, 100 or 300, and increased serum osmolality, usually it is above 295 millismol per kg, the diagnosis is there. You don't need, uh, in such cases, water deprivation test. You don't need to measure ADH or copeptin or aquaparine. It is a new test for measurement of ADH. Uh, I will not talk about management uh, of diabetes insipidus. It is straightforward. If the, my surgeon tell me from the beginning that the pituitary stalk was uh, damaged and it is not identified and it was uh, removed, I know that the most likely DI will be persistent and not temporary phenomenon. But if the surgeon tell me that uh, the pituitary stalk is preserved and identified, and there is a polyuria and uh, diabetes insipidus, I realized that it could be transient due to ma manipulation. In such cases, if it is transient, I usually, if it is a multi eye, I will usually replace one cc to one cc of isotonic saline or half saline. Uh, if the patient is alert and can uh, first mechanism is intact, usually I instruct the patient to drink as ad libitum, yani yishrab hasab al atash. Usually, if the patient uh, he is alert and thirst mechanism is intact, not damaged, it is enough if there is polyuria is less than four liter per day. But if it is more than that, it is disturbing for the patient. I add a mineral sometimes, sub Q injection in very small dosages in order to avoid the big swinging from hypernatremia to hyponatremia. Usually, the swinging must be per day no more than eight millimol per liter per 24 hours. To avoid either, if we are treating diabetes insipidus, we must avoid hyponatremia and we must avoid brain edema. On the contrary, 
I will talk about, which is maybe also common in patients with uh, craniopharyngioma and other disease, it is hyponatremia. Hyponatremia, uh, it is uh, the syndrome of inappropriate AD secretion. Uh, it is uh, consists of hyponatremia, inappropriately elevated urine osmolality, excessive urine sodium, and decreased serum osmolality in eovolemic patients without edema. In such cases, to diagnose the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, we must exclude hypothyroidism, we must exclude adrenal insufficiency, liver cirrhosis, heart failure, in such cases, and diuretic use. <clears throat> After that, we can tell whether the patient truly have uh, the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. The Parter and Schwarz criteria for inappropriate ADH secretion, it is decreased plasma osmolality below 275 millismol per kg and inappropriately concentrated urine more than 100 uh, millismol per kg. And the patient is eovolemic, he is not dehydrated and he is not hypervolemic. Uh, and there is usually elevated uh, sodium in a spot urine, we measure sodium, it is more than 40 milli equivalent per liter. And the patient, as we mentioned, must be eothyroid and there is no adrenal insufficiency. <clears throat> uh, there is a lot of uh, conditions which can cause hyponatremia. It is hypothyroidism, hyperglycemia, adrenal insufficiency, hypopituitarism, and there are some conditions which can cause a pseudo hyponatremia, which is hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, hyperproteinemia. Uh, pseudo hyponatremia, as we mentioned, it is in hyperlipidemia, a gross lift, there is elevated triglycerides, usually uh, we can face hyponatremia, and the same applied for hyperproteinemia. And if there is a high sugar, also we, uh, there is a hyponatremia. Uh, this is a formula which is used to correct for hyperglycemia. Uh, you can correct uh, serum sodium with this formula. A lot of medications, they can cause uh, hyponatremia and syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. They are part, uh, therefore, the taking history is very important. Uh, the medication which can cause hyponatremia and syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, usually antidepressant, um, uh, immunosuppressive drugs and drugs used for treatment of cancer, and also non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, which I do not prefer to be used after surgery as an analgesic. I do not uh, prefer to use non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. There is uh, a lot of conditions, other conditions associated with the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Uh, any central nervous system disturbances like stroke, hemorrhage, subdural uh, hematoma can cause syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Also malignancy, particularly small cell carcinoma of the lung, uh, CA of pancreas, neck and head car uh, carcinomas, genitourinary tract carcinomas, they can cause the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Pulmonary disease like pneumonia, telectasis, bronchiectasis, they can cause, TB can <laughs> cause a syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. A major surgery, whether it is abdominal thoracic, via pain mechanism, it can cause hyponatremia and syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. HIV, hereditary syndrome, and idiopathic. Uh, symptoms of acute hyponatremia usually uh, if it is acute, usually definition of acute hyponatremia must be documented within 48 hours. And yeah, suppose uh, that you are measure uh, serum sodium, two days ago it was 140 and dropped to 130, 120 within 48 hours, this is acute hyponatremia. Uh, usually the symptoms are uh, vomiting, it could be headache, lethargy, abdomen and eventually seizure uh, can occur, coma and respiratory arrest can occur if serum sodium drop below 115 or 110. 
symptoms of chronic hyponatremia, usually there is an adaptation for chronic hyponatremia and symptoms may be absent, even with serum sodium below 120 millimol per liter. Uh, usually symptoms of hyponatremia, uh, it is vague, dizziness, fatigue, uh, memory loss, cognitive problems, uh, gait disturbances, the patients, elderly patients, they are prone for fall and they exhibit fractures. What is the test needed to confirm the diagnosis of syndrome of inappropriate age secretion? It is serum osmolal uh, osmolality and urine osmolarity plus said, uh, spot sodium in the urine. And uh, of course, kidney function, you have to rule out hypothyroidism, thyroid function test. You have to rule out adrenal insufficiency you have to rule out hyperglycemia and hyperlipidemia. Management, usually the cornerstone of management of hyponatremia, it is water fluid restriction. Patients after surgery taking a lot of IV fluids, a lot of IV medication. You are giving a lot of antibiotics, they are diluted with fluids, with uh, IV. Uh, you are giving, as example, dexamethasone, you are giving a lot of medication you, we have to take into account the total IV fluid plus oral intake uh, to calculate the total daily dose. Usually we restrict fluid to 800 milliliter per, per 24 hour in order to treat uh, hyponatremia. If there is uh, acute symptoms of hyper, hyponatremia, we must give hypertonic saline 3% or what, what is available. Here may be available 2.7%. We usually give boluses uh, 100, 150 ml per 20 minutes, 30 minutes, then we measure uh, electrolytes frequently. The goal is not to increase serum, serum sodium from, as example, 120 to 40 within 24 hours. The allowed uh, uh, correction time for hyper, hyponatremia, it is around only 8 millimol per liter per 24 hours in order to avoid, uh, in order to avoid the osmotic demyelination syndrome, which is a uh, rapid correction of hyponatremia can cause uh, this syndrome, which uh, usually it is common in patients with alcoholism, malnutrition, liver disease, hypokalemia. Uh, in this syndrome, uh, usually the symptoms usually start a few days after correction of hyponatremia, not at the same time, maybe four or five days later, dysarthria, dysphagia, paraparesis, quadriparesis, confusion, coma. If there is a damage to both um, bilateral pontine demyelination, the patient presented with lactin syndrome. Of course, we have other agents now uh, for correction of hyponatremia. If it is a chronic hyponatremia, we have uh, tolvaptan. It is uh, oral agents, but in emergency cases, uh, these agents, it is, uh, they are uh, not preferred uh, because they can cause uh, thirst and rapid correction of hyponatremia. It is better to avoid an uh, uh, acute situation. It is good in chronic hyponatremia. Also, the same applied for D-microcycline, D which is tetracycline derivative and lithium. Both of them can be used in patients with a chronic hyponatremia, but not in acute case, uh, in acute phase, because they are slow acting. The the effect usually take place within five days. Uh, this is the uh, latest guidelines from the European um, Society of uh, Endocrinology about the management of hyponatremia and in patients with syndrome of inappropriate ADH, ADH secretion. They are proposing here uh, as a, a second line, they are proposing to give small doses of loop uh, diuretic uh, like furosemide and uh, to give a high dose of salt intake uh, around 30, 40 grams per day orally. Uh, you can increase sodium, but I think it is not uh, uh, 40 gram uh, orally uh, salt intake it is not uh, not adequate I think the best approach in acute uh, hyponatremia is hypertonic saline. thank you very much
thank you, Muhammad. Uh, I knew Muhammad now for about the last 30 years, and I'm proud to say that we have not lost a patient for DI or for the athletic nurse. It is a teamwork, and the difficulty of surgery is matched only by the management of water electrolyte animals. Uh, Dr. Farsak is here, so we'll go back to the presentation. Uh, I'm going to present our experience about uh, credit from Germany. All the pictures that I'm showing is actually from our own cases, me and Dr. Brian Speer. I'm not getting any pictures outside our own cases uh, because this is our own experience uh, lecture. Uh, Craniofrangioma is divided into papillary and adenomatous uh, types. The papillary actually is very rare. Uh, this is uh, one case out of 33 cases that we have together. You can see it's a cystic, it's a simple cyst, usually there is no brain invasion. And beta catenin individual is membranous, not cytoplasmic, it's not uh, Not cytoplasmic uh, or uh, nuclear. Mm, okay. Uh, the adenomatum is the most common, and uh, usually they occur in children and adults. We have two peaks of craniofrangioma, one peak in young children. And the other week after 50s, uh, usually, as you can see, you know, they are cores of islands of squamous cells. Typically, uh, they mimic very much amyloblastoma in the jaw because they have the same origin. They have, they have palisadic cells and uh, stellate reticulum cells and uh, with keratin and superficial cells. Yeah, there are four layers of squamous cells. It's very important uh, to emphasize that there are four layers because we did a project on this one. See, for example, I will show you here the four layers. Again, the, the placating, the stellate reticulum, the wet keratin here, and the superficial cells. Each one of these, it seems they, they stain differently with different types of uh, cytokeratins and indicate that evolution of different types of adminatum uh, uh, craniofarangioma. You can see here, for example, here it's always, always, in adventurous current different job, there's brain invasion. So this is not a sign of malignancy. It's, this is considered benign. This is the brain and this is the squamous cells. These are the superficial squamous cells and they are the basal cells. Basal cells usually, uh, they have a palisating pattern. And this is the wet keratin pattern. There are many times you see uh, histocytes, warm histocytes, and this is cholesterolically because of the uh, contents of the uh, craniofrangioma from the keratin disposition. And this is always their brain invasion. You can see um, uh, 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 changes and xanthomatous uh, uh, changes. And adenomatous craniofrangioma, the beta ketanine, uh, this is the case that probably both of them are different tumors. Beta catenin is positive in nuclear and cytoplasmic. You can see strong. This is different cases that we have. Oh, uh, you can see the nuclear staining here, nuclear and cytoplasmic, strong staining, different from a papillary meningioma, which is usually just membranous. So I believe actually uh, papillary and adenomatous uh, meningioma are two different diseases, uh, two different entities. Craniofrangioma. Uh, in our study, we did study uh, on these cases. Actually, this is uh, the only study that's present in the literature differentiating the four layers of craniofrangioma. Uh, we did different types of cytokeratin. You know, cytokeratin is the one that stains intermediate filaments of cytokeratin, and they are present only in epithelial cells. And, but there are so many different cytokeratins, more than 20 types of cytokeratins. We applied this on uh, craniofrangioma, and we found that uh, these are the cytokeratins that Markers 7, 20, 19, 5, 6, high molecular weight cytokeratin, low molecular weight. Epithelial membrane antigen is not cytokeratin, but one that, that stains usually epithelial cells. And this is 63 also is not cytokeratin, but also stains uh, uh, epithelial cells. We did on, uh, uh, this study and we published it. We can see the different types of uh, uh, staining on different types of uh, uh, layers of 
This is high molecular weight cytokeratin, and you can see it stains uh, the, the stellate reticulum and the basal cell layer. Uh, this is the, the low molecular weight cytokeratin. It stains strongly the basal cell layer, while much less the stellate reticulum cells. Cytokeratin 19, we have a story with it. It stains mostly the basal cell layer and the uh, superficial layer, and this the stellate reticulum. Uh, we noticed that cytokeratin 19 stains all, almost all of the uh, cysts on the brain, and we published uh, a, a study on this one. Uh, cytokeratin 7 stains uh, the stellate reticulum mainly. You can see this is the stellate reticulum layer, but it's negative on the basal cell layer. And cytokeratin 5, 6 stains mostly the superficial cell layers. Uh, and epithelium membrane antigen membrane bucket stains mostly the stellate reticulum and the superficial uh, cell layer. And you can see here. And B63 stains mainly the basal cell layer. Uh, and you can see in different areas. And it's nuclear staining, not cytoplasmic. Uh, so uh, each one of these layers, it, it, they are distinct and they have different cytokeratin staining. Uh, this is very important because sometimes uh, it, it enters the differential of uh, craniopharyngeal with small specimens enter the differential of radix cyst or uh, epidermoid cyst. And you, by, by doing this, uh, and we, we, we actually added this in the literature, you can really rely on the small biopsies whether this is, if it stands, for example, for cytokeratin 5, 6 in uh, stellate or tick cells, this is unlikely to be epidermoid cyst. This is B53 uh, expression. Uh, actually, this is very, very variable. Sometimes it's, it's almost 50% of the cells, and sometimes only one cell, and sometimes there's no staining. But we don't, we, we do not think you know, this is really related to any aggressiveness of the tumor. And the same thing also, QI67, uh, it ranges in our study from uh, uh, 20% to almost uh, zero to one person. And this also does not correlate with the uh, prognosis. Uh, CD68 is part of the histocytes. You see a lot of uh, CD histocytes infiltration in the tumors. And this stains the cystocytes. As I said, GF GFAB stains the brain tissue, and it's very typical to see craniopharyngioma in infiltrating brain tissue. The brown staining here is the brain tissue. You can see how extensive. In other tumors, like in meningioma, consider this is part of the malignancy. But in craniopharyngioma, this is normal to see invasion of the glial tissue. Uh, sometimes they infiltrate the pituitary, you know, as, as in this case. And we did uh, cytopovice it stains the cells, and this does not indicate that it is a malignant sense. Uh, we did actually many publications, me and Dr. Ibrahim, on the, the cases that we have, we do together, because we are not just only in private, although we are in private, we, but we are very much interested in uh, uh, producing more and more papers on the literature. And uh, we did about uh, nine cases, these are the cases. This is one of the cases that we did, um, on the craniopharyngioma and was accepted. This was presented in the camp in Las Vegas in 2016. And you can see differential expression of humanist markers for epithelial squamous cells in adenomatous craniopharyngioma. And I'll show you, I showed more details in the case. And this is another, this is the paper that we published in this International Clinical Pathology Journal. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, the cytokeratin 19 that actually we presented uh, in the Nashville, uh, Tennessee uh, camp, uh, American pathologist uh, meeting, and it was accepted. We, we pointed out, and actually this is the first time I saw it in the literature, that we pointed out that cytokeratin 19 stands all cyst cystic lesions in the brain regardless. And probably this is because of cytokeratin 19 present in the very early cells on the brain tissue. And with it, but with it, and most of the uh, cysts in the brain tissue actually they originate from embryogenic origin, although they may present later in life. And that's why probably cytokeratin 19 present in all these cases. Thank you. I just want to allude to the young generation in this room about publications. Myself and Hassan are all people, but here to are working on publications every month. How many publications have you done, young people? If you don't do it now, you'll never do it. Back to the treatment, as you said, surgery is the mainstay of, uh, of management. 
and we listen to Dr. Mohammed Juma alluding to the management of the electrolyte uh, balance and balance and uh, fluid. Uh, here is another person who plays a great role in the management of these uh, people. So I'm calling upon Dr. Faraz Abayesha to present what are the difficulties of anesthetizing a patient with craniofacial Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Firas. I'm a anesthesiologist at uh, Farah General. Uh, I'll be talking briefly about the anesthetic challenges that we face uh, during the uh, anesthetizing patients uh, with the cranial pharyngioma. Um, the anesthetist plays uh, a vital and uh, very important role, uh, especially in the uh, uh, that the patients with uh, cranial pharyngioma require a multidisciplinary teamwork, including the endocrinologist, neurosurgeon, uh, oncologist, and the anesthesiologist as well. And the intensivist <laughs> can be post-operative care. So uh, in the pre-operative period, uh, the anesthesiologist should pay, should pay attention to several issues. Most importantly, the tumor size, proximity of uh, the tumor to the critical structures, so uh, this is very important to, uh, to know what to expect during surgery. And the effect uh, of this tumor on the intracranial pressure and the endocrine abnormalities as uh, most importantly, diabetes insipidus and syndrome of inappropriate ADR secretion. And in some case reports, there are uh, case reports in patients with cranial uh, pharyngioma with cerebral salt wasting syndrome. Uh, this should be done closely with consultation with the uh, endocrinologist and the effect of radiotherapy if already given preoperatively. Uh, as many patients uh, receive radiotherapy, and this would affect uh, so many tissues, uh, and surgery would be much more difficult if the patient has received radiotherapy. In terms of anesthetic uh, considerations, uh, no, uh, as uh, Dr. Ibrahim has uh, alluded, uh, previously that most of these uh, tumors occur in, in the pediatric population. So we should not deal with the pediatric population uh, just simply as small adults because there are so many differences in terms of anatomy and physiology, especially when it comes to neurophysiology uh, as the blood-brain barrier is not as uh, <clears throat> mature as the uh, adult population. So neurosurgery in the pediatric population is very challenging. Uh, especially as we said to the neurophysiological variation that exists between the adults and uh, the pediatric population. Uh, one major issue that we uh, challenge that we face uh, during uh, uh, cases with cranial pharyngioma is the vascular access. Uh, because whenever you anesthetize a patient uh, with cranial pharyngioma, you have actually to secure at least two peripheral intravenous line. And we should always, always consider a central line in case we need uh, inotropes intraoperatively and postoperatively. And in case uh, we need, uh, in case we face diabetes insipidus uh, intraoperatively, which is rare as compared to the postoperative period. Uh, then we might need either desmopressin or vasopressin infusion. It's very important to stress the monitoring during these cases. Uh, it's mandatory to have a direct uh, blood pressure measurement using an arterial line. Uh, this is to closely monitor blood gases, especially uh, uh, partial pressure of, uh, of uh, carbon dioxide. This is to control uh, the intracranial pressure. Uh, serum electrolytes should be monitored closely uh, instead of sampling the patient uh, and punching the patient every time. So an arterial line would be uh, life-saving in these situations uh, for frequent sampling. And to actually calculate those malality, which I will be talking very briefly later on, and the hemoglobin uh, levels intraoperatively as these cases uh, might be faced with uh, massive bleeding intraoperatively. What are the intraoperative uh, considerations and risks uh, uh, during uh, cranial pharyngioma cases? Adrenal insufficiency, uh, which might be actually uh, diagnosed preoperatively, perioperative steroid replacement, and this uh, should be discussed uh, thoroughly and uh, very closely with the endocrinologist. 
significant blood loss, uh, as I said, especially when the tumor is very close uh, to the vascular, uh, the major vessels in the brain. Uh, diabetes insipidus, which is most commonly encountered post-operatively, as I mentioned, but actually in some cases we might actually uh, encounter it for the first time intraoperatively. Hypothalamic disturbance, uh, and as uh, Dr. Ibrahim has stressed out that the hypothalamus controls everything in your life. Uh, so if any hypothalamic disturbance, this, this would mean uh, that intraoperatively we would, uh, we would face uh, uh, thermo, uh, ther thermo dysregulation. So temperature uh, dysregulation intraoperatively, so temperature control is of utmost important. And this is one of the cases that you have to be in close contact with the surgeon to inform uh, the surgeon intraoperatively that uh, we have wide variations in temperature. As the segment the changes, this is especially when the surgeon is working very close to the anteromedial nucleus of the hypothalamus. This is extremely important because this might mimic uh, ischemic changes uh, so it might be mistaken for an MI intraoperatively. So uh, if the surgeon is working very closely, especially to the anterior medial nucleus, it should be differentiated from uh, any cardiac event. And then seizures and uh, brain stem injury, because this would reflect on the patient postoperatively in case they are, remain in a comatose uh, uh, state. And then uh, avoid bucking and uh, coughing and on oxidation. Uh, of the trachea, this is on recovery of the patient post-operatively. And thank you very much. As you can see, this is a multi-system, multi-modality management of the patient. It is not one person show, it is group uh, people, uh, group of minds looking together for the benefit of the patient. Uh, I hope you are ready now for the bullet train because I'm gonna go very fast. Surgery is the mainstay of the management of these tumors. Basically, people uh, are two types. Either people who will go for radical accession or people who will go for biopsy, so-called partial accession. This is a criminology for me. This is a crime to take a biopsy and send the patient for radiotherapy. I say it loud, I've seen it for 30 years. It is not on. Still, it is practiced in this part of the world. I will give you the evidence that this is not good. Difference between radical excision where there's no recurrence, missed recurrence, and no one procedure, no radiotherapy, and so on. I collected for you the major surgical series, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. 1977. Uh, Harold Hoffman, who is considered to be the father of pediatric surgery, is from Toronto, and he actually is a mentor of so many pediatric neurosurgeons. He was talking about radical excision of cranial injury, 1977. Uh, again, Hoffman, together with uh, people in uh, Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, 1992, Aggressive surgical management of the cranial brain joint. Look at this back in 1990. It is mentioned in textbook called Humans. We advocate radical resection as the optional treatment in all patients, especially in young children. And they added incomplete resection is a virtual guarantee of recurrence within three years. So no argument about it. Still you find mediocre surgeons standing and talking about AFC and radiotherapy. Uh, this is the giant of giants. Hamad Ghazi Yazajir from Turkey, who lived in Switzerland, United States, and now back to Turkey. Uh, his paper in 1990 approaches long-term results in 144 patients with total removal. 1990. Uh, Falbusch, Rodolf Falbusch, who works at any in Hanover, Germany, surgical treatment of cranial pharyngiomas, experienced with 168 patients. Complete resection with acceptable morbidity can be obtained in 80 to 90 percent. These are the giants of neurosurgery. Again, Rodolf Falbusch, 2012, 2012. 
Uh, he's now, he, he was in, at Erlangen, Germany, 73 patients, radical accession. Conclusion of his paper, open surgery with intended total resection remains the treatment of choice in most patients. Majid Sami, giant of giants of neurosurgery, advocate aggressive removal even for recurrent or giant uh, tumors. Here we are together with uh, Frank Bush and myself. Uh, this is radical surgery in neonates. And uh, this is coming from Germany. Craniofaryngiomas in adults and children. Study 122 surgical cases from Paris. Conclusion. These are real papers. Radical surgery gives better outcome of survival, full recovery, and better quality of life for both adults and children. Is there any place for any mediocre surgery? to stand and speak about biopsy and radiotherapy. I hope they would be uh, disappearing from the world totally. Another paper, surgical management of recurrence, not only the primary cases, recurrent cases from Japan. Conclusion, recurrence of cranial pharyngioma can be safely managed by using contemporary microsurgical techniques. The role of surgery and adjuvant radiotherapy if you cannot remove it may vary in the future, but this is the mainstay of treatment. Notice here, first surgery, second surgery, first surgery. So even if you have recurrence, you treat it with surgery. But if you are a mediocre surgeon and you have never done a case in your life because you are sitting in a bunker uh, doing nothing, then you would advise biopsy and radiotherapy. Paper from USA, clinical in German children, surgical experience at Children Memorial Hospital, total resection provided in the post in the best outcome. Paper from Turkey, this part of the world, clinical in German children. Conclusion, treatment should be individualized. The goal of surgery should be gross total removal. Uh, this paper, again, from Tomita, from uh, Japan, about 54 cases. Total resection provided the best outcome. From Argentina, radical resection of the pharyngioma by Zucaro. These people we meet in Karina pharyngioma meeting. I attend and I travel with my daughter here to Canada test. I travel 20 times to 30 times per year to these conferences. So I know what I'm talking about. And I don't want to be the certain of the resident standing in the meeting and say that. This is biopsy and radiotherapy. Sam al Mifti, another giant of surgery, is from Syrian origin in the United States. Uh, Petrozal approach for total removal of giant tumors. Look at this paper efficacy and safety of radical resection of a primary or recurrent craniofaryngiomas from Wissow in the States. And from France from Christian Saint-Jean and Saint-Rose, who is again a giant of pediatric surgery. France is full of uh, giant pediatric surgeons, Christian Saint-Jean and Maurice Schultz and many others, Diroco and so on. So again, he's uh, advocating radical excision. And what does he say? The best overall result is achieved by complete resection, by experienced craniofaryngioma surgeon, not a mediocre surgeon who does not know what to do. If you cannot do radical excision, then you do some total resection followed by radiotherapy. So an experienced surgeon who could not do it, then you can give radiotherapy. Majid Sami again for the giant uh, tumors, for the current tumors, 56 cases, 21 more giants, radical excision. From China, radical resection. Again from China, radical resection. Total resection. Uh, this is from Edward Blows. If you don't know Ed Blows, he is the giant of pituitary cellular tumors. Giant of giants of pituitary, together with others, but he's the most prominent. He was the chairman of the Neurosurgical Society, and he's the chairman of the American Surgeon, College of Surgeons. Here we are in a meeting in uh, California for the Pituitary Society, which I am a member. What does he say? Unfortunately, non-surgical options have provided limited benefits. So don't go for other than surgery because they are, they are doing some risk for you. 
Non-surgical abstinence should be reserved as adjuvant treatment following surgical management, following surgical management. And the best long-term outcomes have been reported following a gross total resection. Do you need more evidence? Here you are. From Korea, 2015, complete resection. Yes, 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 the answer. Is complete resection possible? Yes, yes, yes. Again, another recent one, 2018, radical accession of pain in German from Japan, 81 patients, radical accession. Again, radical accession from Fing, 2018. And this is from Mayor Bennett. I think you believe Mayor Bennett in Russia still. Maximal safe resection by a microsurgery, whether microsurgery or endoscopy, provides very good tumor control. So do you need more? We have covered the whole world and covered the whole complications. Pediatric, especially for pediatric, it is the primary for the skull based surgery, but it is for skull based surgery, for experienced surgery, not for pediatrics, who knows nothing about neurosurgery except to put screws in the back of patients and put the shot. Endoscopy is another form of surgery which has gained popularity. And look at this use that you see with endoscopy. I maintain and always say that endoscopy and in endoscopy lies the future of neurosurgery. It is evolving, it is very beautiful. Look at this piece of anatomy optic nerve there, optic nerve on the other side, the KR. You can see the stroke coming from the head, and it's going to split a bit down. You can see the detail. Beautiful view. Papers, the Vitis 2007, the Vitis from Italy with Paolo Cavabianca from Napoli. Look at the views that they produced with their endoscope. But they are going for radical excision, they're not going for biopsy. So, whether you're doing it through craniotomy or doing it through the microscope or using it with the endoscope, the aim is radical excision of the tumor. So, look at these views. From Kassam, 2008, with this group, Paul Gardner and the others, they also produced this beautiful paper about the classification of craniopharyngioma by endoscope. Accession from Italy, again, the same group, especially from Giorgio Frank, my friend from Italy, is uh, one of the best endoscopists. Uh, Fred Gentili from, from uh, Toronto, Canada, presenting this paper with his uh, Associate Dashati. And look at this. They are going for radical accession. So it needs a dedicated team. It's not one person. Neurosurgeon, neurologist, endocrinologist, ophthalmologist, neuroradiologist, neuropathologist, radiation oncologist. It is one team. So the Arabi, So if you have experience, you have an impact on the extent of research. If you do radical accession, this speaks highly about you. If you don't, this speaks low about you. So it is your state of mind when you want to start the operation. Are you going for radical excision or you have started already thinking, I'm going to go for biopsy. And you speak to your residents, convincing them that I am a wise surgeon and I'll stop because I don't want to damage the patient. You want to stop because you don't know how to operate. So am I going for biopsy or am I going for radical excision? I'm going for radical excision. Maybe I can't, but this I have tried. I give the patient the best chance possible. What are the bad practices that I have seen? Insertion of Omaya reservoir. For goodness sake, this practice is still on in Jordan and Asia and in Arab countries. And this is a crime against humanity. Who is Omaya? It's Ayub Khan Omaya from Pakistan who was born in Pakistan, but he migrated to England. He studied in uh, Oxford, in Cambridge, and then he emigrated to the United States. There, they he started his work in a research fashion. Uh, they were giving intrathecal antibiotics for people with meningitis, or giving intrathecal chemotherapy for cases of cancer. So they used to do lumbar puncture every day. Imagine a little boy, you do lumbar puncture every day. So I said, oh, let me think of something. Let's put a reservoir here, connect to the ventricle. And each time you just puncture the vein, the reservoir. It was a great idea. 
for a great inventor. Um, he has a great inventor. He is thought of highly because of this invention. But he, he produced this invention for another kettle fish completely. Mediocre surgeon jump on the idea. This is the treatment for cranial hematoma. It is a crime. It is very much behind for any, any surgical practicing is a low class surgeon. Look at this. Omega is allowed to input. You inject a dye, you inject so and so. It is nonsense, total utter nonsense. It is not the purpose where Omega reservoir was invented. And this is paper about seeding, because you do the dropper, the puncturing, so you may seed the uh, tumor cells. What does my clinic say about this? Omega reservoir is only palliative and should only be used for terminal cases, terminal dying people. It is not a primary treatment. It should never be considered as a first line treatment. In Jordan, in the Arab countries, in Asian countries, it is the primary treatment because the surgeon is a mediocre. Another bad practice? Oh, yes. Too many. Shunt. They shunt anything. Look at this. Tumor, they have put a shunt. Why? Because he cannot take this tumor. So what should he do? He put a shunt. If this was my boy or your boy or girl, you would not accept this. Why do we accept it for others? Look at this. Look at this chunt, even if it is put in the wrong way, because even we don't, they don't teach them the proper chunt. This is a very, he should fail in the exam. He should be kicked out from the residential program. Worse, bilateral deviations, bilateral. Not one right side, bilateral. Look at this. Tumor is the same, and you have two chunts inside. So I produced this paper, published it in the Surgical Neurology, and I called it, Do We Need a Neurosurgical Interpol? We have crimes, we have criminals, and we should point them out because they are doing damage to our people. So I call it, call the Interpol if you see such a neurosurgeon. Do we need a neurosurgical Interpol? Yes. We should consider the creation of a neurosurgical Interpol to exchange information about the criminal neurosurgeons. God knows I'm doing my job. This is going to be a war because these people, they will at least a government because they are mediocre surgeon, they will fight you back. So I call it the neurosurgical therapy. <laughs> what about radiotherapy? So many forms of radiotherapy, but the mainstay is surgery. And then if you cannot do surgery, then you can go for radiation, whether it is external beam, whether it is conformal beam, whether it is intensity modulation, proton beam radiotherapy, therapy, and brachytherapy. But remember, most of these people are children. If you give them radiation, you will damage their brains, cognitive functions, etc., etc. And this is one child who had received radiotherapy after biopsy. Look at his brain being necrotized completely. So people produce papers comparing different types of treatment. Uh, this is from USA comparing conformal proton radiotherapy with others. And they say there's no difference. Another paper also comparing different types of uh, radiotherapy, but they say proton beam is the, the best. And they compare IMRT, PT, and the conformal radiation, and they found that the uh, dose fall off is better in the proton beam. I say that because I am a radio surgeon and I know these uh, physiological facts. Again, here comparing different types of stereotactic radiotherapy with the, the conformal radiotherapy. The dose for off is less. The green is the dose for off, fixed in the brainstem. Here, the green dose for off is little. From Harvard, combination of different types of radiation, but again, that is if surgery has failed to do radical excision. Radio surgery, another crime pushing the button and just getting thousands of dollars and doing nothing for the patient. So there are limitations and this tumor is inside, attached to the optic apparatus, so you should not even think of using it. <coughs> Having said that, I am a radio surgeon. I have brought the gamma knife back in 1996, but I always say a fool with a tool is still a fool. And these are papers about, uh, look at this, you cannot, you shouldn't. <coughs> give this attached to the optical apparatus. And look at the result. 
after one year. It's just the same. And this week about tumor control. What a nonsense. Gamma knife treatment. Look at this. What a result. After 30 months of and so on and so forth. So what about intracystic radionucleotide? I remember in my days, uh, we were talking about yttrium 90 and then it evolved the mass in 32 and uh, interferon and so on. Some papers using bleomycin. Bleomycin is antibiotic that was found to have uh, anti-metabolite effect. So look at this, bad result. I mean, it is not good result, so you should not even publish this paper. From Brazil using interferon, and again, they say, oh, look at the tumor. The tumor is still there after two years. Phosphorus 32, how many times? Once, twice, thrice, or four times you inject this, and if it leaks outside, the patient will die. Let me give you the conclusion of this. What is the use of intracystic biomycin? This is by Liu. Searching multiple databases. Please mark my words. Multiple databases, mark my words, articles, reviews, conference proceedings, ongoing trial database. We are unable to promote the treatment with intracystic rheumatism in children. Period. Bye bye. And you should not give this to anybody going for surgery. It does not cause adhesions. So, what are the complications that we see due to the treatment? Can affect any structures in the area of the of the uh, tumor, especially the titty. Look at this. Before before anything, before any treatment, by surgery or others, twenty five percent they have some hormonal disturbance. And post treatment, a good number of them would need thyroid. They would need growth, and they would need uh, treatment for the eye. Don't be fooled. You have to treat them. Once they reach you with hormonal imbalance they are not going to recover. Hypothalamus, obesity, they eat much, so they gain weight. They don't sleep well. Temperature either rising, rising up or down, and psychological. Obesity, in particular, before treatment is 35, and after treatment 55. Vigil, before treatment 50, 80, 30, 60, after treatment. And they can develop hypothesis in 50 to 60 percent of cases. But what about the prognosis and all these? How do we look at clinical job? Is it good or bad? It's good. It needs people who can actually operate on this. Look at this from Finland. Five year overall survival, 73 percent. And this is an old paper, 70 to 82. From USA National Database, recent paper, 80 percent over all five years of life. From German registry, 98%. In Jordan, in Arab countries, in Asian countries, if you have a plan in Joma, you will die. You are sentenced to die. They put Omega Reservoir and they just keep injecting, 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 or put shunt, revision of shunt, until the patient dies. Let me think about my personal series. We mentioned before, that you get a cranial for enjoyment every two to three years, that if you are lucky and all the cases are filthy. I was lucky, extremely lucky. People don't want to operate on cranial for enjoyment. They throw them at the knee and I am happy to take them. 102 cases, one of the largest series in the world. That's why I'm a constant uh, visitor of the cranial for enjoyment conferences. Children more than adults, but look at this, giant ones. 74 out of 102 giant ones. Do you believe me? It's up to you. Mostly they are mixed and there they are. Every single case of them, you would say, oh, did you actually start to collect cases since 85? No, I started collecting cases since 80, since I was a first year president. I learned the power of documentation. So every case is documented. Look at the giant sizes. I'm just going through like a bullet train. These are real cases, these are my cases. For all cases, we do physical examination, we do images, 
do visual assessment, we do endocrine assessment and psychological assessment. People forget about psychological assessment in brain surgery. We are constant users of psychological assessment before any brain surgery, including clinical in general. Endocrine, we do the whole host of investigations. And of course, as Dr. Mohammed Juma said, urine and the serum osmolality. You do the brain CT scan, you can see calcification. Calcification can appear in about 70% of cases of craniofacial joints. You do MRI, 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 like this one. And we do the psychological analysis. Uh, usually, Dr. Walid Sarhan does that for us. He has two psychologists, they come and assist the patient before surgery and after surgery, not only for craniofacial joints, but for all brain tumors. This is the uh, ophthalmology investigations that we do, including everything from endoscopy, optic OCT, etc., etc. Uh, front of this German chart where they combine visual acuity with the visual field to give you a score. You can also do the potential responses for the optic nerves. And you do before surgery and after surgery. So in June 2, this patient had almost blind, but look at how the visual fields are open. So not only before surgery, but also after surgery. I love to use the laminative analysis approach, but I'm not only a master of this approach, and I'm considered as a master of this approach in the world, but I use other approaches accordingly. So I have tried all the approaches that I've mentioned, telurinal, subfrontal, bilateral subfrontal, transvasal, but I love this approach. And there are many people like me who love this approach. It's people from Japan speaking about this approach in the hemisphere, you go between the two hemispheres. Another paper from Japan, again from Japan, about the transbasal approach. And uh, this was one of the paper by Michael Mitchell Gerber. Mitchell is a man of uh, glioma, but he does uh, a lot of uh, other tubes. And this is my course, uh, work course uh, session. It's my corona. I put it behind the hairline so that when the hair comes, you will never discover that he had surgery. And this is the laminar terminalis where I go. This is a paper by my friends from Italy. And these are the views of the laminar terminalis. This is if you go to the woman, you would come sideways. I don't like this. I've tried it, but there's always a missing angle. Here you are seeing everything. This is the tube, this is the optic chasm, this is the prefix, and here we go through the terminalis. Look at this tumor presenting through the laminar terminalis. So if we look here, this is the right optic nerve, left optic nerve, optic chasm, right optic tract, left optic tract, and the tumor is presenting through the laminar terminalis. And look at the view here after the section, you can see. The basal in the depth of the wound. And uh, a piece of anatomy here about the Lilliquist membrane. Lilliquist is a, uh, a surgeon from Sweden, and he discovered this membrane which is made of two leaflets, the upper leaflet and the lower leaflet. You have to know it by heart how to find the Lilliquist. Some of my cases, uh, I call this Hiroshima and Nagasaki of uh, It looks like Hiroshima too. You go for biopsy here? No, you go for biopsy extension. Another patient with this larger tumor is follow up with radical excision. No radiotherapy, no chemotherapy. Another patient from Syria with this extensive complex. Look at this. We are in the lateral retrieval and going down to the colon of the And he presented with hydrocephalus. Do we put a shunt? No because we are not criminals. So we excite the tumor completely, and there he is. Another patient from Yemen, this giant tumor before and after surgery, had a mentinoma, a difficult one. Patient from Iraq, back in 1998, Kurdistan, and there he is. Another patient from Libya, this extensive recurrent kind of 
again, formula model to formula magnet. Some techniques, the analysis of the techniques, the technical technique, 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 because this is what they can do. Okay, don't put a shunt symptom to somebody who can do the surgery, no? Because they want the money. They want to train people to do shunts. And when they train them, they train them, they train them wrong. So we did the mechanic session for this patient and for the month for so many years. Patient from Libya with this tumor, husband is a GP, and she was pregnant 36 weeks, so brought her to the cesarean section the tumor completely. Patient again from Yemen with this tumor, before and after, before and after, this lady. And this lady came in from, uh, I think from Bahrain. Uh, somebody tried to go through transnasally, which is not a good approach to start with, ended up with causing aneurysm of the carotid, so she was referred to us for gamma treatment. Of course, we didn't uh, we utilize her aneurysm and then we went and totally excised her tumor and sent her back home. Let's look at some of these videos. Maybe you'll believe me after all. No, not this. Not necessarily, not necessarily at all. The percentage of clinical is going malignant is very, very little. Only 23 cases reported in literature. So this is one case. Again here, you have to appreciate, this is the chiasm. Behind the chiasm here is the laminar terminalis. And if you open it, you will get fluid, the usual engine oil fluid. That's what people do. They just open the cyst, drain some fluid, hooray, hooray. We have done decompression of the antichiasm. Nonsense, crime, because this fluid is gonna develop within two weeks. So you want to go and look at this after the drainage of the fluid, look at the amount of the tumor we are removing. This is the bread and butter. This is gonna give you the cyst. And if you're gonna treat it with radiotherapy, it's not gonna work. If you want to put Omega reservoir, it's not gonna work. It ends with death of the patient. So you can find the plane of the cleavage. It is nonsense that they talk about there is no uh, plane of the cleavage. There is always a plane of the cleavage, but you just have to look for it. You have to be persevering. Let's go for the second one, just to show you a taste of these cases. Maybe you would believe me. Another case where also here, it's a pre prostate scan, but the tumor is totally in the third ventricle. So this is the stroke. If the stroke is healthy, I don't touch it. If it is tumorous, I take it immediately. There's no point in giving a tumor in the stroke. And if you have a good endocrinologist like I have, then you know you can manage the patient well. But if you leave a stroke with a tumor in, you're asking for trouble. So there you are. So tumor after tumor, it's a school of thought. It's not one case. So here, we're splitting it from the right optic tract. Okay. This is a recurrent one. Recurrent clinical injury treatment, hmm. surgery, not radiotherapy, surgery. It's difficult to disconnect these adhesions, but this is the price you pay to get good results. Here we are dissecting the arachnoid membrane at the carotid system. So lots of, I will just move fast, a lot of adhesions. You just open it, recurrent. No, this was recurrent. This was removed completely and it came back. 
and they are more adverse. Look at this here again. You can see the optic nerve and the chiasm. So you start removing it. Again, fluid coming out. Hooray, hooray. Decompress the optic apparatus. No, you have done nothing. You have done a crime. You have to remove the tumor completely. Have you done the second degree? Yes, I've done the third degree. So here is the stoke. Stoke is completely tumorous. There's no point in leaving it. It will cause recurrence. It will cause the tumor to stay there. So I'm cutting the stoke. I say it loud. If this stoke is tumorous, I cut it. There's no point. It is not even functioning to start with. But it harbors a tumor. So you work before the chiasm and after the chiasm, and then you manipulate the tumor out. But just putting this case for you to show you that you can do radical excision, even in recurrent tumors. Here, you are seeing the reliquous membrane, the blue thing deep inside is the reliquous membrane. And what you see inside is the basilar artery with its bifurcation. So here you are, basilar artery, with the superior cerebellar artery and posterior cerebral artery. If the stoke is not involved, I keep it. Okay. Now we'll put the in 3D. So we'll be watching that screen. Just to show you the difference between 2D and 3D in terms of education and in terms of details. So I have to put the glasses, the goggles, like the old pilots of the Second World War. You have to see depth. If you don't see depth, then your goggles are not correct. Is this a new technology? No, it's about 10 years old. But we are the only ones using it because we care about teaching, about transmitting the information to junior people. How many? How many? I will come. There's a slide to, to, to speak about the occurrences and the complications. Because if I stand here and say I did not have complication, I would be a liar. Any surgeon says that he did not have a complication is a liar, or he has not done the case. So he did not have complications. So are we set? Everybody is happy with his Googles so that we can fly together into the depth of the ocean. The neurosurgery is to operate under water in the cavities in the caves under the ocean. We should have had two uh, screens for 3D, but unfortunately, we were promised to have a second one. We did not get it. Hopefully, we will. We'll have three because we need uh, for a big audience. But for tonight, it's enough to. That's if it works. Are you in 3D? You have the depth. So we're working here inside the cellar between the two optic nerves. I'm holding the tumor in my forceps and trying to dissect it. Imagine that this surgery is done without microscope by, by mediocre surgeons. Imagine. Here, you can use the ultrasonic aspirator. Some people are afraid to use it. Why? You are in control. 
So you can point it to what you want. But if you put it on the object, it will take it out, it will check it. So you put it where you want. If you can use it, especially with calcifications. Here we are removing the tumor from the optical chiasm, and immediately the blue thing that appears in the depth is the basilar artery with its termination. Here we are removing the tumor piece by piece, never in piece, never in one piece. It's a piece made. See basilar? The blue thing there with its final termination. Here I'm finding a Attachment to the stoke. The stoke is here. This is the stoke here. And the tumor is attached to it. But the, the stoke is not uh, infiltrated by the tumor. So I keep it. Here we are. We are trying to remove the tumor off the stoke. The stoke is pushed. It is pushed to the side. This is the chance of the patient. If you don't give him that chance, hell, don't, don't even think of doing surgery. Yes. So here we are, we're moving the last piece of the tumor attached to the stoke. The stoke is still functioning. When I finish Dr. Juma, I preserve the stoke. Or oh, Dr. Juma, the stoke was infiltrated by the tumor, so I totally uh, cut it because it's a tumor. Look at this view. Beautiful view. Only skull based surgeon, only craniopharyngeal surgeons can view this view. If you are not, don't try it. Don't do Umayyad Reservoir. Don't put the shot. Don't do these crimes. It's beautiful view. Okay, second one. Last one, actually. Oh, cool. I'm going to talk first. I'm going to talk first. Another recurrent craniopharyngeal. So not only for the primary meningioma that was never been operated upon, also the recurrent ones, you can achieve radical total excision. And I'm here using the ultrasonic aspirator, just nearby the optic chasm. I'm not afraid to use that. It is calcified and it's the only way to excise the tumor. Tell me, if you leave this tumor, how would the patient survive? How would the patient benefit from radiotherapy or whatever? It's a huge tumor, recurrent. Take it out. You start seeing the basilar artery now. Calcified tumor. But you can't find the primary cleavage. If you are a bad surgeon, you don't want to look for it. You just did it and say, I'm a wise surgeon, I will stop here. I don't want to damage the patient. You don't know. I made it my job in life to expose the mediocre surgeons and to expose the mediocre surgery that is done in our country against our people. It is my duty in life, and I will not stop until I die. It is my duty, religious duty, humanity duty, that we should point to the wrong things and say, this is wrong, stop it. Even if 99% are doing it, they must stop it. Almost, almost 99. <laughs> so you go for the last piece of the tumor. The surgery can take 12 hours, 15 hours. I don't mind. I don't want it to be 12 hours, but it can't take that much until you reach there and you dissect and so on and so forth. We'd love to do the surgery as quick as possible, but not as funny as possible or as mediocre as possible. So piece by piece, you take the tumor out, piece after piece after piece. And some of the residents would say, doctor, this is endless tumor, it does not want to end. Truly, it is endless. You remove piece after piece and still come out the tumor. Can you put it from surgery, which one that would be found here? No, never. So this is the end of it. You can see the optic chaos and the nerves. The olfactory tract is preserved. Again, the mediocre surgeons would cut the olfactory because olfaction is not important for them. They will cut accessory nerve. It's not important. They will cut the brachial plexus. It is not important. They will chop half of the cerebellum because no one needs half the cerebellum. 
and so on. And they convince resident, residents that this is the right thing to do. This is not the right thing to do at all. So we'll stop here because we are coming late in time. But this is how it looks at the end of the day. So I've done 102. I had two mortalities. I'll share one with you. This was done at St. Elsewhere, meaning another hospital. Uh, wrong perinatal inside, tumor is still the same. What is the solution but to go again and do the surgery? We did surgery, beautiful surgery, but for one reason or another, slow deterioration in the eye on the seventh postal. Not because of the eye, just slow deterioration for no good reason. Morbidity, complications. Let me remind you of this paper, famous paper by Falbush, that post-operative post endocrine improvement is exceptional. You don't never say that my patients improved in uh, because they never do. Most of them, they would need some support. Some of my complications, subdural hygroma, hydrocephalus, CSR1 leak, meningitis, et cetera, and some temporary endocrine worsening, some temporary obesity, and so on and so forth. Recurrence, this is what we are asking ourselves. Of the 84, what I did radical, mind you, this is the whole number. I've done radical in this. I went in with the intention of radical, but I just couldn't with all my experience. So I have to accept defeat, but not to go in with the mind that I'm going to do biopsy, I'm going to decompress the fluid and so on. This nonsense that they are using. With the subtotal resection, the recurrence is higher. And because it is going into the wall of the carotids. So you pull it, you have a baby. You have a catastrophe. Uh, one of the cases of recurrence, this uh, beautiful girl with this tumor, we did total <coughs> radical excision. So even if you do a total radical, there's still a chance of recurrence. What about if you do biopsy? It's 100% recurrence. So she went out and came back with this huge recurrence. Treatment? How many years are about? Shunt? No, medical excision again. There she is, grown into a beautiful young woman. What about obesity? A few slides and we'll finish. Obesity could be before surgery, it could be after surgery. And I have not noticed obesity in old patients. These old patients of mine did not have any obesity. All adults did not have any obesity. But with kids, yes. With the radical excision, you can rest assured you will have obesity. Is that fearsome? No, I'm not worried. It will disappear in one year's time. So look at her coming back to her normal without any treatment, just by telling them when to eat and how to eat. Look at this beautiful girl knowing some obesity and then going to be a beautiful girl again. All these children, they develop obesity and then it disappeared. And uh, this is an observation of mine that nobody has reported so far. I'm the only one who's reporting this. This is a patient from Sudan, again, in way to go back to his mom. And this beautiful girl also did not even gain, except for the slight weight. Last but not least, this is the last slide. I operated on this boy back in 2001. This is his post operative MRI. Immediate was of the following day. 2003, 2005, no recurrence. Of course, no radiation, no shunt. 2012, 13, 14, 16. Look at him. I think the, the satisfaction of seeing this boy growing without the misery of radiation, without the misery of a shunt or a mayor as well, is most security for me. Not uh, some of amount of money of any kind can give me the satisfaction that I had from this boy. So this is as he was young, and this is 20 years later. Fully active, he's going to get married. He's a second year student in the college. And this is his yesterday photos. Thank you very much. <laughs> any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. No. I just comment. Um, and, uh, 
you stress in your lecture and every lecture about your uh, total excision, complete excision training in German and about my practice in society. I think uh, new surgeons who are doing just biopsy or just putting some uh, or there's a wall or anything. He is doing that because he hasn't the strength, he doesn't have any skills and proper training to do that. And at the same time, he doesn't want to be patient. And we don't have the culture of this, I will refer to that doctor, he's better. We don't have a structure. And I think until we have uh, you know, some sort of anonymous hazard. Uh, if I'm not sorry, I can't be right. I don't have a technical motion. 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 I but the patients of the NAS in random sucre HPLC control by the dose Very nice. Well, but I have an orthopedic surgery, thyroid surgery, everyone. So I know that I'm not going to ask the market to be actually, but I don't have an orthopedic surgery. Thank you. Any questions or comments, please? Thank you so much for your conversation. Can you tell me what is the new HR1? And it's very difficult to do the community section. For two reasons. The first one is the infrared yoga has done the final section. The general and all the other departments for two people. And so also the mini journals. Yes. And so also the. The second thing is this initiative has another process. And uh, it's very important to differentiate between the back time and the middle time associated with this level of the world. Because the animal uh, time is uh, completely delayed. And we have to look for the differentiation between the parts. We have to look for the team of the people. If it's a high context, it's an identified 60% person. And second one of the new CTC and talking about classification, because classification is about 70, sometimes 90% in the identified table of the category 38. The third thing is the spectroscopy. Now, we are using spectroscopy to differentiate between two types. Because the identified there is a wide public spectrum, which is very hard, but the person can be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the thing about clinical enjoyment are difficult is an old teaching and it has just kept in the minds of mediocre surgeons. Telling their residents clinical enjoyment cannot be removed. Wrong. It can be removed. All the tumors in that area are attached to the current and they are taken out. It is your duty to remove it. Any question or comment? First, very my question is about the follow-up process. How often do you follow up with the follow-up? All patients of brain tumors, whatever that is, I keep monitoring them every three months for one year, every six months for two years, and every year thereafter. Forever. Forever. If no questions or comments, thank you very much. We'll meet next Wednesday. Hi, Dr. Sabea, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, thank you. A, a new oratorium, huh?
Yes. Oh, very <laughs> good. Very good. Let me briefly introduce the neurosurgeons that are here with me now so that you're, you to see that you are reaching people outside that oratorium. Hello, Anas, could you please introduce yourself? Go ahead, Anas. Are you there? Anas, hello, hello. Anas, could you please introduce yourself? Go ahead. Sorry there, Doctor. Sorry. Go ahead, Anas. Please introduce yourself. Well, I guess we're not getting through. Okay, Khalif, could you introduce yourself? Uh, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, salam alaikum. Uh, Dr. Khalif, uh, watching you from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, uh, presentation. As you said, the what, what we've seen about this disease is that it's 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 recurrence rate, especially when you don't take out the capsule. And the fear that most surgeons have of pan pituitary hypo, pan hypopituitarism after the surgery. So those are the biggest two issues that that we are facing, and that it's very common with this disease. It is unsatisfied fear. It is yeah. bad teaching. It yes. is a legacy of the past. Clinical yes. idiomas are difficult to remove. If you remove them, they will go into mean hormonal and endocrine and hypothalamic. Forgetting yeah. that if you leave a tumor there, the tumor will yeah. do the job for you. It will cause the patient to be worse, and then you give it yeah. therapy, and the current functions will go. So it is legacy of the past. The treatments of clinical endomas has to improvise, and you have to go ahead with the recent development. With the surgery, with the radical surgery. surgery. So what is what is an acceptable acceptable morbidity? According to, to as you've seen in my series, I had two morbid mortalities in 102 patients, which is the universal yeah. accepted range. And the same thing with morbidity, as I always say, that if a neurosurgeon say that I did not have complications or mortality, yeah. he's lying. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gabulo, do you want to say hi to your friend? Yes. Uh, good evening, father Hello. and mentor. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, father. It's you. Thank you so much for the great. Yes, thank you so much for the great presentation. I'm really impressed about your series. That was great. I'm I'm really impressed. So my small question was, uh, you didn't mention much about visual disturbances. Yes. What do you think, like, what is the, reco the, the recovery of visual when patient present with complete blindness before surgery? Do you get patient who recovered visual? Sure. Uh, first of all, I have to mention that Dr. Carolo is a friend of mine and he's recognized worldwide as a skeletal surgeon. So thank you for joining us. That's what the individual manifestations. Most of the time, about 50% of patients come with visual manifestations. If you catch them early, they will improve. If you catch them late, they will not improve. So the better to go as early as possible or as radical as possible. Very good. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'd like to introduce Anas to Dr. Sabaya. Hello, Anas. Could you please introduce yourself? Good evening. Good evening. I, I can't hear you, Anas. Can we can't again? hear you, Anas. Um, uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Um, thank you for the um, was a very interesting uh, I'm sorry, Anas. I, I don't think we can hear you. I don't think Dr. Sabe can hear you. Okay, we'll, we'll have to save that question, okay? Yes, he can send it to me on the internet. Oh, can you hear him okay? Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, I want to ask him. Uh, uh, because we uh, preserve the anterior one third of the superior sagittal sinus. 
hear you correctly, you are asking about the interhemispheric approach. And what I do with the interhemispheric approach is that I cut the severe surgical sinus at its most anterior part. And I make a point that I should not damage one vein in my way. Sometimes you have to sacrifice one vein, but that's it about it. And once you do that, you cut the severe surgical sinus at its very anterior most part, and then you can retract and then go interhemispheric. You can find the anterior uh, communicating artery and mobilize it, the arachnoid, and see the optic nerve chiasm. You can see the perforators of the anterior communicating and proceed from there. And that, and that by the way, is from Germany. Uh, okay, Dr. Sabe, I'd like to thank you very much. What is the topic next week? I have not decided yet, but we will find something very interesting, I'm sure. Okay, very good. Congratulations on the new auditorium. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. See you okay. next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, okay. We're, we're okay. We stopped recording now. Uh, I, I know on us, the production is, you know, we'll get, we'll get better with the sound next week, right? Sure. Yeah, we'll work, we're, we're going to work on that. Uh, but that that's a new auditorium they had this week. Uh, so it's so, a beautiful auditorium. Yeah, beautiful. But yeah, we got to fix the sound because as yeah. you know, as you saw, the the sound is uh, you know that's an awesome background. Man. <laughs> yeah. The people tell you that that's an awesome. You see that background? That uh, oh, by the way, Dr. Khalif, this is a yeah. He's from Germany. And that's how are you doing? I'm from Kenya, Nairobi. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, what were we saying? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, the sound from Anas is not very clear. He's too far from uh, from the computer, maybe he is too. Oh, he's too far from the computer, maybe. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, move, move uh, your microphone close to your mouth. Or yeah. maybe he needs to get an earphone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the best. I mean, your sound is good. Uh, great. Uh, and thanks, John, yeah, and John my, sound, my sound's good too, right? Yeah, uh, yes. very good. Is it, it, but yeah, I mean, most people don't want to wear headphones. So yeah. that's okay. That's okay. But, Dr. Kabula, uh, you worked with, with Dr. Ibrahim? Yes, I was with him in Jordan two years ago oh, with, okay. uh, with uh, Professor Vinko Dolenk. I went oh, there for, okay. yeah, for skull base. For how long? Cad cadaveric dissection, one week. Mm -hmm. Oh, one week? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Well, you know, it's funny, Dr. Gabulo, uh, Khalif and I are talking about trying to set up a, a virtual cadaver lab. Wow. From, from that's, Nairobi. That's cool. Yes, you yeah. told me last time. Yeah, yeah, we hope, yeah. We, we think it may be beneficial. And certainly it doesn't cost anything to try it. You know, yeah. Uh, as I was saying to Grace today, uh, she's very nice, by the way. Um, Did you talk to her? Yeah, yeah. I, had, I, was couple, I, had, I, had, I had an emergency, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. I had, uh, Dr. Kabula, we had a meeting uh, with an associate of uh, Khalif, uh, and okay. we, she was, I was going through how we may be able to set up a smartphone above mm -hmm. the cadaver. And I showed yeah. her uh, because mm -hmm. I entered the Zoom. And, and put the smartphone and then change the camera so that you get the, so I, she understands the concept. Okay. Wow, she's she's for it, yeah? Yeah, all we have to do is just figure out something, uh, you know, like a lamp thing to mm. hold the smartphone over. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be an expensive setup. I think it could be very simple and creative. Yeah. As long as you get the smartphone over the field, that's all we need. Because we don't need the yeah. audio from the smartphone. We just need the, the camera, which is a great camera. Smartphones are great cameras. So Yeah, so we'll hopefully we'll be televising our conference from Nairobi next year. They're doing some renovations in that place. We are going to have a skull base, endoscopy, and spine uh, workshops at that center, Nairobi Surgical Skills Center in August, so before that, then we'll be able to, to set up things. And then after we do that, then we are hoping that it's going to be uh, something that is going to be continued. Good, good. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe uh, I'll continue to talk to Grace and uh, 
Uh, yeah, they're I, doing some renovations now. I don't know whether she told you. No, no. Hey, yeah, what, in, in the auditorium? Or? From what in the, yeah, in the auditorium. Mostly in the auditorium, yes. Not in the lab itself, but in the auditorium. Oh, okay. So they're fixing the slabs. Actually, it's, it's a donation by Johnson & Johnson. Oh, the whole cool. Thing, the whole thing. Oh, really? Yeah. To, 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 to make it more digital friendly, the auditorium? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'd like to yeah. see that. So it's, because it's, uh, we could just plug into it. If yeah. They're all set up. It's probably got a fast speed connection. Uh, yeah. And, and, and uh, yeah, all the accessory stuff. So, yeah. Uh, we'll tell them this, Go ahead, Dr. Kabulo. Okay, Dr. Kalif, there's another conference in December in Nairobi. Yes, that one is uh, that, that one we're also going to televise it. But uh, okay. we are going to have that one we're going to have. Uh, simulation neuro neuroendovascular simulation okay oh yeah go. that's uh and there's dolan okay. and uh <laughs> dr kabula yeah Kibula and dr, dr. And dr. dr. Shibay. Shibay, yes yeah. on my right and the professor dolan on my my left let me try okay. to show are you coming uh, to are you coming to nairobi in in december Kibula? yes yes i will come to nairobi excellent excellent, mm -hmm. excellent. december and also Mas also next year I guess, yeah. Did you attend the yeah. conference so, this week that was in, where was it in Congo? In my country. I'm from Congo. Yeah, the research. Oh, you're and, from Congo. And, yes. Unfortunately, I couldn't afford it because I'm writing my final year, my final exams in next week. Okay. Okay. Cosexa. Uh, yes. Are you doing No, I made, I made master's. In Congo, yeah? At the University of Zimbabwe. I'm in Zimbabwe. Oh, okay. Oh, you're in Zimbabwe. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yes. Okay. So yeah, that's the, the lab. Of, Catabaric of, lab. Yeah. In, in oh, they have a very nice lab. Yes, nice one. Yeah. Is it? Does this happen every year? Is it an every year course or? It's yes. One? Yes. So where's year. Where's this lab? This lab in Amman. The the oh, prof. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, in Amman, Jordan. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we have. When is the there. next one, Dr. Kabulo? Uh, I will try to talk to Dr. To Professor Shbei. Uh, when yeah. is the next one? I will let you know. It's a I very really nice attendee. course. Very nice. Yeah. You get really your cadavers, you see, to get your head there. Like this time we were doing the Dolenk approach. He himself was there, so he go, oh, okay. we were going step by step. He does this, then we also do. He does this slowly until we finish his approach, Dolenk approach. Oh, that's very good. Good, good laugh, huh? Good. Yeah, yeah, nice one. Very yeah. nice one. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, a oh, yeah, you also yes. smoke some shisha. I see that. <laughs> yes, that's shisha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, we may be televising from, uh, I think we're pretty sure we're televising from uh, Tanzania. And uh, let me show you mm -hmm. guys, let me show you guys the schedule. It's the Co Well Cornell Medicine course. Yeah, with, uh, um, with Jumo Magogo. I don't know if you know Jumo. Uh, let, let me and get And Professor Roger Hato. From New York? Yeah, there's a couple other people. There's a, a pretty good lineup, it looks like. Uh, let me, yeah, let, let me, me see the... Let me open it up here and show you the schedule. Yeah. Okay. Now there's... Let's see... Dr. Hartle is going to be there. You probably, I've heard of him. He's been all yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, yeah he, the, Professor Raja, I'm yeah, going to he, meet him. He's in, in, he's in, in Pakistan. Islam. Yeah, he's in Pakistan like the week after. Uh, yeah. Because I'm televising that too. And I said, man, you got Are you shot. televising that too? In Pakistan. Yeah, we're, pa we're televising from Pakistan on the 15th. A wow, big, con a big awesome. conference. The Akron. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of big names about. there. A lot of big names are going to be there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just I just talked to him today to televise it. Jumo uh, I just talked to uh the, the Pakistani neurosurgeon that's running okay. the conference. Oh, okay. Yeah, Tariq Khan. Tariq Khan is his name. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, this one I'm going to attend. I'm going to be there in Dar es Salaam next week. Oh, you're gonna be is uh yeah, I'm going to be there. Prof I'm oh, you're going to be in Tanzania? Oh, you're going to be in Tanzania? I'm going to be in Tanzania. I'm going to be in Dar es Salaam. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So, you remember, you remember I told you I'm coming to New York? Yeah, yeah. When, when, do you, when do you start that ro uh, rotation fellowship? 
I'm, I'm starting that in April next year, and Professor Roger Adon is my, my supervisor. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So it's a good fortune I'm going wow, to Wow, that's there. what a great opportunity that is. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome a really, really good opportunity. Uh, yeah. So you're so, going to televise this one, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're going to televise it. I'm, I'm trying to work it out right now uh, with, okay. with the technician. The technician is a very important connection for me, you know, because yeah. it, it, it helps me a lot if I can, you know, experiment and tr try things. And it, like today's production, you know, the camera was off, <laughs> the sound was bad. I mean, it wasn't, yeah. a, wasn't a great production, but you know what? <laughs> we make mistakes. Yeah. We make yeah. mistakes. We're not perfect. And we're yeah. learning. We're learning. Learning. It's, uh, yeah. It's yeah. Thank, you know, thank goodness it's not a, you know, a big sponsor that's watching everything. We're, we're developing the art. <laughs> yeah. When you first be, start cutting with a knife, you're not great. Yeah. You know? not, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh, awesome. It, yeah, it, it's fun. I, I love it. Uh, Anas, now you're in Germany. Are you doing, are you a resident now or doing a fellowship? Yeah, I do my residency program in uh, Digendorf. Um, I am in the sixth year. Oh. Wow. I will okay. be. Okay, L uh, listen, Anas, I put your name on the mailing list. So you're going to get notices of all the conferences. And you're, okay. and you're given a link to come in if you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, that's pleasure me, yeah? You can uh, list my name. Okay. Okay, yeah. And you can also join Neurosurgical TV as a member. It's free. And you can download the app. Now, we're working on the iPhone part of it. Apparently, a couple of people are having some problems. So, but yeah. I'm talking to the developer tomorrow. Uh, oh, yeah, check out, check out. The, do you have an Android, uh, Khalif, or an, uh, Apple? I have an iPhone and it's working. It's it's working for me. It's fine. Oh yeah, I tell you, yeah. well, today's conference was right on the front page. Boom! You open yeah. the app. It's open, and then uh, uh, then if you there tap, it, you guys tap see it, it once, you can enter in. <laughs> can you guys see it? Uh, oh, sorry. There's see, a... Let me. Let me uh, Pin you. Okay, let me get off the screen share. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's the live. Uh, yeah. Like right now, our conversation's on because we're really live on YouTube. It's not yeah, being recorded. So it's... it's not being recorded. But uh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, this can turn into kind of a networking thing, you know, uh, before and after conferences. You know, just... well, there you go. Yeah, you're hearing me talk now. <laughs> <laughs> on a slight delay. I, I have a question. Well, you know, this yeah. See, we're, we're live on uh, on the. Yeah, app. there's a small delay, but it's good. Yeah. On a slight delay. Yeah, there's a slight delay. Yeah, about well, 15 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, it's a slight delay. It's great, man. It's great. It's great. It's oh good. yeah, yeah. The I think the app's going to help a lot because you know I foresee. Yeah. I, I really think that more people will participate from a smartphone. Yeah. Uh, you know, not many times neurosurgeons are sitting at their desktop. You know, most of the time Very they're on early. the go. They're on the go. They're on the go. Yeah. But hopefully they'll be able to jump in and you know comment and jump out whatever well that's a beautiful picture that's what that's uh no this uh, is in december the rock, the rock yeah that's in december that's mount kenya well it's in kenya yeah hey i was talking to a friend of mine he's gonna move to nairobi oh okay he's welcome yeah, yeah I was just, 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 just an hour ago uh he, oh. he, yeah he lives in thailand now but he's he likes nairobi he's gonna go there for a while i think and I mentioned, I mentioned to him, I said, oh, I'm probably going to a conference there and this and that. So, yeah, it's a small world. Yeah. So this is uh, off the coast uh, of Kenya? No, this is right in the highlands. It's a Mount Kenya. It's, a, it's an island in a, in a lake? No, no, no. This is it's, it's highland, highland. It's oh, okay. Yeah, so this, this is going to be at this conference in... Uh, 
uh, in December from 28th to 22nd. You see that Professor Yoko Kato is going to be there. My boss, Professor Kureshi. Uh, and so, something's happened to your sound. It's getting kind of funny. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear it, but it doesn't sound good. Yeah, it doesn't sound good? Oh, now it does. Now, I don't know what happened, but it's okay now. It's okay. Yeah. That's, a, that's an island off the, uh, the coast of Kenya. No, this is, this is not the coast of Kenya. This is uh, far from the coast. This is near Nairobi. Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, Professor Yoko Kato, Professor Kureshi uh, are going to be there. So we have Love a very Kato, good line Kato, of... Kato, Kato's going? She's going to be there. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, they were nice enough to give us a gift. It's a neurosurgical TV. Yeah. That was nice. <laughs> So yeah, so we'll 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 be televising this one hopefully. Oh yeah, yeah. We'll, yeah. Uh, pack it. So this was to Tanzania, and then after that, Pakistan, uh, and it's I'm late not sure December. So, so yeah. you know, it, it's going to be on a on a smartphone whole, continuously. It'll be streaming. Yeah. You know, a couple of days. So hopefully, neurosurgeons will be able to touch base with either both those conferences hopefully hopefully anyways right. okay very good i'm gonna record it and edit it and we'll send it to you thank you thank you thank you okay I'll, co I'll communicate uh, with grace and we'll we'll try to work s something to out yeah keep keep the conversation going on yes great okay thank you thank you john thank Take you so easy. much bye-bye